Somebody said okay, that's good. Just uh, a couple items. The uh, Obviously, last Wednesday night we had class on Thursday. I was in northern Kentucky, Cincinnati, and listening to the local radio station down there. And we've talked about the condition of the society we live in today. I don't know how many of you have heard the story of the little eight-year-old boy that committed suicide. This little boy was at a Cincinnati public school and was bullied by another eight-year-old. And I guess there's a, an 18-minute video where this bully was picking on kids and you know he hit one kid in the stomach and he doubled over. And Well, this particular little boy, eight-year-old boy came in. This little boy was, uh, from everything that I heard story-wise, is a good kid. He wears, always wears a tie to school. and and actually goes up to shake hands with this bully. Well, this bully grabs his hand and throws him against the wall and basically knocks him out. He's unconscious for seven minutes, according to the video, before anyone even realizes. Um, so basically, the school calls the parents and basically said that he fainted. They didn't give all the, this happened in January. Um, he complained that evening. They took him to the emergency room, did some checks, nothing. Two days later, this boy hangs himself with his tie on his bed. Now, the coroner initially ruled it a homicide because, and I heard her interviewing, uh, being interviewed on the radio, and she basically said, what eight-year-old thinks of suicide? Eight-year-old should be, and she has kids, so she talked about my eight-year-old is trying to use my, grab my phone to play games or grab candy, and, and, and you think of the world we live in today that with the bullying situation that here's an, an eight-year-old that basically uh, whatever happens is lacking in his life that uh, he could be draw, brought to that at that point. So, and then obviously then Friday we have Kirkersville here. So it's just it's, uh, the world we live in. We as Christians have to really shine. And, and what we're talking about specifically with pers personal evangelism, and then we talked about last week about those drifting away, now referred to as a current. We think about our lives, the things that happen in our lives, and we're all accessible to that. I mean, that, that can happen to any one of us because we can't control every event, everything that happens in our lives. And because we are part of the world, because we are in the world, we can't be part of the world. We're there, but, but we have to, we can't stay away from it. I mean, we're, we're there, so it's, it's difficult. And so when we look at what we're talking about, it's important that we really make sure that we have the basis of, of what we believe and try to represent because it is a tough world we live in when things like that happen in our society. A fact that I got today with my emails and snippets of information, we were talking last week about those and the, the situation with our society and our church and how many churches have, have uh, decreased and things like that. One of the emails that I get basically says that, uh, let me get the right one, because it talks about how many people believe the Bible today. So this is a, this is a, recent, this is a recent Gallup poll. And Gallup took a poll, and they just, this was this morning, an email that I get. And basically it says, fewer Americans than ever believe the Bible was the actual word of God taken literally. And what it says is the percentage of Americans, the, 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 the share of Americans who believe that the Bible is to be taken literally has reached a record low, according to a new Gallup poll. Less than one in four Americans, so 24% of Americans believe that the Bible is literally, word for word, the word of God. This is the lowest percentage in 40 years, according to Gallup. And then you go on to read, and it basically says that 26% of the respondents called the Bible a book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. And uh, so, when we, again, when we talk about, last week we talked about the decline of the church and, and Christians in general in our society, and then Gallup comes out with a poll that basically says less than 25% of, of Americans today believe that the Bible actually is the Word of God and it's something that we should follow. So when we talk about personal evangelism, is it an easy job? <laughs> when we have most of the people 
less than 25% of the people, when you go to quote the Bible, chances are that person's not going to believe the Bible is truly the Word of God, to court the Gallup. Now, that doesn't obviously mean that everybody that we've talked to, that, that one in four believes that, but according to the poll, the Gallup poll, that that's kind of where we're dealing with in our society. Any thoughts of any of those? Don't mean to start with a downer, but it's kind of... Well, no, no. I mean, when you look at the church with just 12 people and, and what they were able to accomplish and do, uh, so it, it is. And, and they had the worse odds. They had worse odds than we do. Uh, so, so today we're going to keep looking then about uh, as far as slipping away and how many why our numbers. And what we talked about last week was that there's issues that that create that cause us to uh, basically to slip away. We talked about that. Uh, again, we, we use the analogy of a boat, and, and a boat that's not anchored properly can be even a, even the, the, the just a, a normal tide can a current can take it out to sea or take it out farther. And then obviously, if there's a storm, it, it could be worse. And we talked about some of the things that could some of the current issues. And we talked about time, how in, in the world we live in today, how everything is go go go, and um, society and, and what society says is normal, just like that Gallup poll. Society says the book is the Bible is just a, a book of fables, which we know is not true, but that's what the world says, society. So there's so many things that that we can that can help help take us off course if we're not anchored. So what I want to look at tonight, I want to talk about, is what is our anchor? What are we using to anchor us? Joe says Christ. Uh, we have a song in the songbook. We're not going to sing it. Number 614. We have a song. We have an anchor. And it talks about what your anchor hold. Uh, so we have to look at what is our anchor. Uh, in Acts, the 27th chapter, turn to Acts 27. And we'll start with verse 27. And verse, so Acts 27, verse 27. And it says, Now when the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Antarctic Sea, about midnight the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And they took soundings and found it to be twenty fathoms. And when they, took, when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be fifteen fathoms. Then... Fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. Now think about this picture. You're, you're in an open sea. It's nighttime. It's dark. So I don't know who likes to be out in the dark. This boy doesn't. So uh, imagine being in the sea, and it's dark, and um, obviously with the wind and things going on, but what it says there is that they dropped four anchors. So what I want us to talk about tonight is four anchors that we could have, that we should have in our lives to help keep us anchored to, to what we believe. What's the purpose of an anchor, first of all? It's very simple. What's the purpose of an anchor? Hold something still. Keep it in place. Uh, we think of an anchor, I think of an anchor as a boat. And I'm not a boater, I'm a, whatever you call that. I'm not a water guy, but I, I'm not out on a boat I'm, or ship or whatever, but I know what an anchor looks like and what it's supposed to do. But the anchor is dropped so that they hold their position in the same regard as us as Christians. And as I was studying and preparing, you know, and I've always known of uh, the crucifixion and Christ's when he gives up the ghost, that the veil in the temple rips in sunder. I never really studied it and thought about it. But let's look at that for a second. That veil, who knows, what's the, who knows anything about that curtain? Herschel? I heard 30 feet, but basically Josephus, we don't really have scripture, but Josephus writes that 
basically it, it was 60 feet wide, 30 feet or 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and four inches thick. And according to Josephus, it took 300 priests to care to handle it. So now, when we think about what was the purpose of this veil, the, the curtain, what did it do for God? What what what's this side is man, this side is God. Why was that curtain there? And man, other than one man, man, were not permitted here, were they? I even read that when the priest went in, they would tie a rope to him. Because if he would die while he was in there, they couldn't go in after him. They'd have to pull him out. Because if anybody other than who was allowed to go, it was death. So what I want you to think about is that before Christ died on the cross, God was kind of off limits. To man, to normal man. Man could not they had to go through. But when this veil, this curtain, and the dimensions and, and the, the fine, the, the way it was made, and the, uh, they actually had a cherubim kind of sewed onto it to kind of symbolize the warning to keep men out. But when Christ died on, when he gave up the ghost, that veil ran in sunder. I mean, basically, in half. Mark? So, so the, the fact that this rent, and son, I mean, and like I said, you know, obviously we, we hear it at the Lord's Supper at times. We, anytime we study this, it, it's something that's there. But I never really, never studied it to think about really what that represented and what it did for us. Because when Christ gave up the ghost, when, when, when he died on the cross, he now opened up to us God. We have God. So when we talk about our anchor, you know, our anchor is God, the Word of God. It's Jesus Christ. And that God ripped that in sunder. Man couldn't do it. You know, Josephus, one of the things that he said, that, that two teams of oxen couldn't rip this veil, this curtain apart. But God could do it without, I mean, just it happened. And, and it basically, it gave up a normal man the opportunity to, to be, at, at, to, to approach God. And that's what we all have every second, every day of our lives. We don't have a specific holiday or feast day to do that. Anytime we can, we can go to God. So when we think about our lives and be it centered, anchored to the truth, to Jesus, it's an opportunity that we have. But we have to approach it. We have to be the one that, that makes that step. So any other questions? You look like you're going to expound there. Another thought with the, with the boat, what I want to kind of you to picture, if you will, is we talked about the boat, and let's, let's think of uh, someone on a canoe. And you're in an area that you're not familiar with. Usually when you're in a canoe, you know, you're kind of enjoying what you see, and, and, and chances are it's, it's um, you know, just gentle water, and you're, not, you're looking at enjoying all the, the things that are going on. But if you're in an area that you're not sure of, and all of a sudden you get ready to get to the rapids, what's going to happen? Chances are, if you didn't catch it fast enough, you're already, you're, you're, and to go down the rapids in a canoe is not a good thing. I mean, usually when they go down the rapids, they're in a the big raft, and you got guys and people. So the point is with this canoe, and on calm waters that then leads to uh, the rapid type place, is that before it hits that rapids, it's nice and calm. And a lot of times in our spiritual lives, that's what we have. We have, it's calm, it's nice. But all of a sudden, it, all it takes is one event, one thing that can happen that can send us down the rapids that are uncontrolled. And if we don't have that anchor, if we're not prepared, if we're just flying through life, then uh, we're at risk to, to lose it, basically. Okay. One of the, the things that we want to talk about as being an anchor also is hope. 
Now, I don't know if you heard the story about Mark and Joanne. They are out hunting. Now, they're both hunters. I won't tell you who's the better two, but Mark and Joanne are hunting in a different area, and they're not familiar with the area, and it's been a bad day. They uh, got no fishes or deer or anything else that they're hunting for, and all of a sudden they realize that they don't know where they are. So Mark says, well, what you do is you shoot up in the air three times, and you stay where you are, and the people will find you. So they did that. Joanne shoots up in the air three times, and they wait. Wait about another half hour. Nobody approaches. So Mark says, try again. So Joanne shoots three more times in the air. Nothing happens. They wait again. And then Mark says, well, let's try it one more time. And Joanne says, I sure hope it happens this time because we're almost out of arrows. But uh, but anyway. <laughs> the hope there is not the hope we're talking about when we talk about our anchor being a hope. What is our hope as Christians? What do we hope for? Pardon me? Eternal life. We hope for eternal life with God, with Jesus, with fellow Christians. That's our hope. How secure is that hope? Is that hope like Joanne shooting the airs in the air, hoping somebody hears or sees it? Is that the hope that we, that we're, that we have as Christians? No, that's not the hope. The, certain, exactly. Our hope is a certain hope because all we have to do to get what what's, we're hoping for is to do what we're told. That's all we have to do. I mean, there's no other... Parts of a puzzle that we have to, that, that hasn't been shown yet, and we have to wait for it. I mean, we know what it is. That hope is a certainty that we have in eternal life. So our first anchor is hope. And Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence be- behind the veil. So we have this hope as an anchor. So one of the anchors that we have in our Christian walk is hope. And that hope drives us to to, to all the things that happen, all all the bad things that that can happen in our lives, the the storms that from a Christian side, from our Christian walk, the the storms that could, could hit us, it's the hope that anchors us, that helps us weather those storms because... Will there be storms in our lives? Yeah, there will be storms. We've lived through storms. We can spend time talking about what we've lived through, but we're going to, there's going to continue to be storms. Because who is Satan after? Us, right here in this room. Because if we look at the poll, he's got 76% of the Americans today because they don't believe in God anymore. They think the Bible is a book of fables. So... Satan is not working on the 76% that's already gone. He's working on us, us, here, Christians, who have that hope, who have that anchor. But if our anchor isn't steadfast, isn't, we can have a great anchor. I mean, if, let's talk about boats again. Let's say you have a great anchor. You just bought a new whatever anchor, one-ton anchor. But what if you have an old rusty chain that's kind of just bubble gum holding it together. <laughs> what are your chances of, of that new anchor holding with bubble gum holding the chain together? Not much. And that's what it is with our faith. The second anchor is our faith. So we have hope, the assurance of what awaits us. And then our faith is the assurance of things not seen. It's that faith that we have. It's the other anchor that we have. And we have to have that faith that keeps us working towards the goal. We're not promised life's going to be easy, but we're promised this is what's there in the end. Um, we can go to all the different things that, that, are, that we look at with our jobs and what we try to accomplish to have, maybe when we retire, a comfortable living. No guarantee, but, 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 but that's what we hope for, and we work hard to get it with no guarantee. Here, as Christians, we have a guarantee. We have a guarantee. Heaven. But how many of us work as hard for that as we do for our earthly items that we, that we work and strive for? 
It's something we need to think about because most of us work hard for that nine to five. We work hard to, to try to get ahead and we have no guarantee of what tomorrow brings, but there's no guarantee there. Here we have a guarantee. We just have to live this life, the Christian life, that life that, that uh, it's easy to drift away. We, we talked about that. It's easy, it's easy to just get in the current and, and not realize where you are until you're, till you're lost. So we need to have the, the hope. And then another verse on faith. Let's look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 tells us in verse 4 and 5, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. He who, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So the way we overcome the world, what world is he talking about there? Yeah, the, the carnal world, the world we live in today. The, that world, to overcome that world, it's the faith, faith is our victory. If we have that faith. So we have to have the hope as an anchor. We have to have the faith as an anchor. If we have those two, is that enough? It, it probably would be. I mean, it, it, that's two good anchors right there. But why not have more if we can? You know, we can look at uh, another one that I have is love. Well, we're in First John. Let's look at First John four eighteen. Just a few page over. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So we have love, and we can go to 1 Corinthians 13 and all the things about love. And we can spend weeks talking about love. But if we look at as our anchors to, to keep us steadfast, to keep us unmovable, is that we've got to have a hope of eternal life, we got to have faith in God. we got to have faith in Jesus Christ. We, we have to have faith that we're going to make it to heaven. And then we got to have that love. When we think about love, and we think about the love that Christ had, that when Christ came to this world, and, and Bill talked about it in class on Sunday, he talked about how basically God came to, to, to the world as a man. And when you think about that, and how Jesus came as a humble man, he didn't come as some, elaborate, some king. He is a king, but, but not in our terms of what we think of as a king. So Christ came as a humble man without anything of, of showiness, but he came as a man, a common man. A, a, and, but yet his message was love, and, and his message was eternal life and belief. And he lived that and showed it to us and experienced life and was a perfect so we have that love that Christ had. Christ had love that he gave us life. And God loved us, we all know. God loved us so much he sent his only son so that we have a chance for eternal life. So when we think about anchor and, and weathering storms, we have to have the hope. We, and then we think of the love. The love that we have for one another. But think about the love, obviously, if you're a grandparent like I am, uh, you, you think about that love, and, and there's something about grandchildren that when you talk to other grandparents, they talk about how great it is. Uh, no matter who you talk to when they talk about grandchildren, not that we don't love our kids as parents, but there seems to be something different about grandparents and the love that you have and what you would do. So, but all of us, as parents and as grandparents, the love that we would have, the love that we have for our children and our grandchildren, it, it's hard to put in words especially when you think about those who don't value life. Uh, when we look at the Old Testament and the sacrifices that they made to their gods, and we think about life today and abortion and things that happen in our world, that when you think about love in our world, it's, there's not a lot of real love in our world today, is there? In the world we live in today, when we think about what love is, there's not a lot of love in our world. Now, there can be songs about love and there people can say, but when you really look at our nature, we no longer are a people of a loving nature, of a Christian nature. When we let the things that happen in our society that have happened, 
And I don't know how we as Christians do it, how we can bring it back, but we have to each day do our part and live the life that we do. People notice the way we live. People notice the way we act and what we do, especially if we're different. If we blend in with the crowd, are we noticed? No, we're not. We're just one of everybody else. But when we're different, we're noticed. Minerva? Minerva says there's too many people in the world who love themselves more than they love anybody else. And that's true. I mean, that's, that's where a lot of people, they, they worry about number one. That's, that's the motto today. And what's the, the golden rule is do it to somebody else before they do it to you. Isn't that kind of how the world's golden rule is? So, you know, when we think about what love really is, we know because we see it every Lord's Day. We, we remember that love that Christ had for us, that he died a horrific death for us. And, and he did it because he loves us, and he wants us. I and mean, again, we talk about that promise. He wants us to spend eternity with him in the, where he's prepared for us. He's made it available for us. We have to just do our part. He's given us the church. You know, he gave us this. This, this was designed by Christ, by God that we would have brothers and sisters in Christ that we can fellowship one with another. We can share a common love. We can work together for a common purpose, and that's to get to heaven. Because if we were doing this individually, would the church be around today, you think? Probably not. But because of the way it's designed, the, the, the fellowship with what we're required to do on a weekly basis, it brings us together and draws us together. And so it's important. So that's that love that we have. And we can, again, go to 1 Corinthians 13 and see more of that. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, the, the fourth anchor that I have here, in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing what your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So our, our fourth anchor is steadfastness. When you think of something that's steadfast, what's that mean? <laughs> Stubborn, not budging. Keep on keeping on. Stick to itiveness. It's all good. Anybody else? They don't waver. You know, when, you, when you think of steadfast, it's not wavering. It, it, it's, it's secure. And that's got to be our knowledge. And it's Because it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable. Steadfast is immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But what I want us to look at is what it said. Sometimes abound in the work of the Lord. When you want to, abound in the work of the Lord. When's it, what's it say? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, it tells us to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. And when we think about that, that as simple as that term is, but how much do we take for granted? Are we always... Today, are we always working in, in the love of the Lord? Probably not. Pro probably not. So we all have to work towards that. And when we go back to where we originally started talking in, in this class and we look at Hebrews chapter 2, one of the things that I want to point out is it says, Therefore, we must give the most earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away. So we started talking weeks ago about drifting away and that point, that part of drifting away and we got to the boat and all that. But what I want us to look at is that first part. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed. Now, what, what does that mean? Now, let's, let's say that um, Joe's going out for pizza and he's walking. And Jenny says to him, be careful out there, because we saw the snakes and uh, scorpions or whatever we saw out there. 
And Jenny's telling him to be careful. Now, is Joe going to take that, that warning about snakes and scorpions or whatever else you can think of, werewolves or whatever, is he going to pay attention to that, you think? Or is he just going to lollygag and just kind of not have a light or flashlight? Or is he just going to just, what's he going to do? He's going to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to pay attention. Uh, my son, when he's around the ocean or he's around water in Florida, any water, bottle of water in Florida, body of water, not bottle of water, but any bottle, body of water in Florida, he thinks there could be an alligator, especially if it's on the golf course. So if he hits the ball close to the water, he's not even going close. He just will take a stroke and throw it down over here because he doesn't even want to be around there. So when we think about this warning, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So it's when we, when we start, when we just kind of heed, eh, we pay attention, but think about that earnest. We think about always. We think about earnest heed. The more earnest heed. I mean, what, to me, that's saying we have to be on the lookout. How's the devil described as what kind of animal? Is it a pussycat? <laughs> yeah, a roaring lion. What's he looking to do? Devour us. Now, I don't plan to go to Africa. If I did go to Africa, I'm definitely not going on a tour by myself. Or any, I don't even know if I would want to ride. <laughs> yeah, I'll take Mark and Joanne and their arrows. <laughs> that don't really work. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't want any part of it. Personally, because what could happen? That roaring lion. But I, as a Christian, do I even think about that? All right, I'll go to lunch with these guys that are going to the bar. We'll talk business. I won't drink, but that's all right. Is that a roaring lion that I'm walking into? Close to? But, yeah, but, I gotta, but we, we let our guard down. Because we don't think about that roaring lion Satan. Because he's not always roaring. Sometimes he's sneaking up. Like that crafty snake. I think a snake, unless it's a rattler, they're pretty, they don't warn. And, and they, they have a deadly bite. So, you know, when we take about more earnest heed, as Christians, we have to be on the lookout. Because Satan, the roaring lion, is looking away to devour us. Each one of us individually, that's what he's looking to do. And if we don't take heed to what's there, we have a chance of drifting away. And it, we're all, I mean, it's, it's there. We, can, we all know people who have drifted away. Who we thought at one point, they were solid people. But I mean, we could probably look at people who we know collectively who have been preachers of the word, who have been elders of the church, who have been deacons of the church, who, who have been pillars, we would call pillars, who have drifted away because they let their guard down. They didn't more earnestly heed what they've heard. And they fell. Comments? David? Okay. Again, that, that makes it clear, pay, pay closer attention to. Much closer, much, pay attention. Joe says it's like a, somebody, a soldier that's in the army in, in a war, when you hear bullets flying, <laughs> you heighten sense of, sense of, of awareness. David? So you, you hear that description, does any of that describe you? Does that describe me? When I think about just going through my life, is, is that the, the attention that I'm paying to the world about me? Or am I just going through life without a care in the world? Or are we consistent with that? Every second of every day as a Christian, we have to be on guard because that's when we let our guard down is when Satan will pounce. <clears throat> Paul
Paul says that we let our guard down just one time and think, okay, it won't, it won't bother. I'll just do it once. But we know where that leads. So. <clears throat> and it, exactly. What's this? I don't, I'm not a painter or anything. But what's it say on a ladder? Doesn't it say something about some warning on a ladder about certain point and say something that you, you, you kind of, I, I saw something on, on, uh, this morning, I think it was this morning, or, but it was about what people are doing now with their selfies, to take selfies and they put themselves in harm's way. There were two teenage boys on the Golden Gate Bridge without, I mean, they were basically the one somersaults and, and, and just kind of, you know, they, 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 they think that they're, uh, Indispensable that, that they're supermen, but but things that people do, uh, they showed one person on a, on a train track videotaping, and the train runs hits him. I mean, luckily he wasn't. But I mean, it's the second we let our guard down, is all we all Satan needs is one opportunity. Think about the people who are so hooked on drugs that never thought they would get to the point where they are. We talked about alcohol last week. You know, the people who are on homeless today because of alcohol, never thought that they would get to that point when they got to that first point when they took that first drink. Or when they, you know, whatever it is, whether it's uh, an affair at work, you know, that first lunch with a co-worker didn't, you didn't think would happen, but now, now you're in a, a, a terrible situation and your family's, uh, I mean, it's what we, where we're here, we don't think about here. But as Christians, if we're more earnestly on the watch, every second we think about here, because what happens today affects here. The world today doesn't think that way. But as Christians, we have to think about everything that happens in our lives today has a bearing on tomorrow, or tomorrow's eternity and what we do. So please take heed, <laughs> more earnest heed, Pay closer attention to what happens in our lives because what happened will affect others as well as ourselves. So, any other comments for the last minute? Okay, we'll continue this next week. Thank you.